My name is Don Keel, and uh, I am the Associate Youth Director for Young Adult Ministries for the Georgia Cumberland Conference. And we are part of a grand experiment this morning. You are. You're, you're a guinea pig. No, you're going <laughs> to... You're going to be co-researchers with us because we're trying something totally new with this whole liaison idea. And uh, it's going to be an adventure, and we're planning quite a few more things we'll tell you about later on the day. Uh, as we get started, though, pray with me this morning. Father God, we thank you so much for your love, for your grace. We pray now that as we spend this time together that you will come and be with us, that you'll guide our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that you will help us as we seek to find new ways to um, engage young people and young adults for the cause of, of Christ. Guide and direct us now. May we have a good day in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've preached at some of your churches before, <clears throat> and... Uh, you have no doubt and I had I thought I had the right thing the whole time and I was just starting out in session two. So there we go. So you've no doubt seen uh, Cahutta Springs, and in the summer, every summer, we have a, a great staff of about 80 kids out there. This was a couple years ago, and uh, every summer they take really nice pictures, and then at the end, then the staff don't think they'll ever do anything with those pictures. They say, okay, be goofy, because we'll say, we're going to give you your time to be goofy, and so they say, okay, be goofy. So since nobody ever uses those pictures, I, I just pulled one of those because uh, they thought it would never see the light of day, but there it is. And the reason I chose that picture is because look at the energy in that picture. Uh, Kaylee's still looking for people she knows in the picture. <laughs> now, now he's doing the same thing. Um, but look at the energy in that picture. Now, current research tells us that we are currently losing two-thirds of our young adults every year. Um, look how much energy we just lost. Are you okay with that? I'm not. Now, we know that we can't get all of them. Uh, but at the same time, we believe we can do better than just retaining one-third. And so um, Rob Lang and I in the youth department are working um, to really try to reverse the trend so that we at least can retain two-thirds. And that's our goal, is to seek to retain two-thirds. And so... Uh, that was just a nice little thing to say. Make sure you put your phones on silent. Uh, so let's everybody take your phone out. Oh, I already did it. Okay, good. Um, and we got it. All right. Now, here's the question for you. And my little clicker is not working this morning either. It was earlier. If two-thirds of your church suddenly vanished, do you think anyone would notice would you notice? Yes, sir. It's a little hard to notice because we live in a society that is so mobile that people are in and out of your church. Is that USB? So frequently that you're not sure whether they're gone or whether they're there or whether they're visiting somebody else or where they're at. No, it's true. Matter of fact, in most cases, uh, we have lost two-thirds of our church. Have you, have you heard people talk about, now how many are on your books? How many are attending? What you're really talking about is that gap. 
And as we go through that whole thing, this is not going to get better because of what Dr. Steele just said. It's transient, very mobile, and you don't know whether they're guests or whether they're... And so what it requires is for us to be, there's a word for this, intentional about how we go about doing this. And, and notice something. It may be my USB port, because that's not, not doing it either. I'll, go, I'll just do this for now. Oh, it just told me there's a whole new thing I could go. Yeah, nice. It's identifying it. I don't have one immediately to the right of the shift key. Okay. So, let's just forget identifying the keyboard. It's not working. Doing more evangelism for those that we're losing uh, does not make up for those we're losing out the back door. We talk about evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. And yet we fail to close the back door. But here's the deal. Some people begin to look at it as an either-or. We have to do evangelism or close the back door. It's not an either-or proposition. It has to be a both-and. We continue to do evangelism, and we close the back door. How do we do that? Great question. There's a lot of different things, and as many different answers for that question as there are questions for, for that question, but when we look at this, one of the key roles that we've dis discovered uh, in Youth and Young Adult Ministries is that if someone is involved, they'll typically remain engaged. Um, involvement and ownership seem to be a consistent thread that runs the story. Now, when I, was in, um, when I was in Academy, my younger sister uh, was, she's 11 years younger than me, she was in kindergarten. Um, she was one of those, surprise, I'm here, kids. And uh, she still comes in the door that way. Um, but <laughs> but um, no one would take her Sabbath school class in our church. And nominating committee met for like six months straight. And they couldn't get anyone to take the kindergarten department. And my dad came home as one of the elders. He came home very frustrated uh, after nominating committee one night. And he says, we can't get anybody to take. And he named off about four positions. We could just have this thing done if we could get somebody to take those. And I said, well, I'll do the kindergarten. How hard can that be? I read my sister's stories every night. And I sing with her with my guitar. Can't be that hard. I could probably do that. And Dad said, uh, that's a great idea. I'll go back next week and tell him that. Well, he got more excited about it. The next day, he actually called the pastor and said, uh, my son says he'll take kindergarten. And the pastor said, oh, no. We can't do that. Um, this happened a long time ago. This doesn't happen in our churches now. Okay, so he can't do that because he's not what? Old enough. Not mature enough. Doesn't know enough. And I'm thinking, how old, how mature, and how much knowledge do you have to have to teach kindergartners? You read them a Bible story, you play some cool games with them, you play guitar, and you go with it. So I said, Dad, how many are in there? He said, three. So it's my sister and two of her friends. They were all already coming over to the house all the time. So I said, tell them I'm old enough to do kindergarten. And I said, besides, Dad, who else you got? He goes, good point. So we went back to the nominating committee the next week, and he said, my son is going to do kindergarten. Just put his name down. And they started a huge debate that lasted an hour as to whether or not I could do it. And Dad said, well, who else have you got? We've worked on this for six months, and no one will take it. He's willing. How bad can it be? What if we have a, a mom sit in with him to make sure it's going okay? Well, they decided that would be fine, as long as a mom was in there. And so I went in my first Sabbath, and I had a whole little program written up, and we sang, 
and we played games, and we did um, little puzzles, and we did the Bible lesson, and that's back when they used to have sandboxes. Remember those? And I moved the sand stuff around the sandboxes, and, and of course, my imagination was a little wilder than most people, so they were pr- pretty cool stories, really, uh, and most of them were true, but um, in, <laughs> or mostly true. If they weren't true, they should have been, um, but uh, pretty soon, parents started dropping by, and then new people began to come and say, well, we'd like our kid in your, in your kindergarten. They seem to be having fun. Well, they are. By the time I finished the year, we had six kids, and we doubled. Whew. Six. Uh, man, that's, that's great, 50% growth rate, right? Just boom. And uh, so we doubled. Anyway, um, and then they decided at that point that I truly was old enough to be trusted. And I began my life of involvement in the church and consequently had a call to ministry as I was in college and really felt called that, that God. And here, 37 years later, I'm leading this because somebody trusted me with kindergarten. Involvement makes a difference. And I began asking people around the office, Rob Lang, when he was in academy, somebody trusted him with a title and responsibility. I asked Gary Rustad when he was in academy, someone, that was me because I was his youth pastor, (laughs) entrusted him with, uh, and now he's my boss, that's weird, Um, (laughs) with a title and responsibility. Uh, I began asking different people all around this office, saying, how did you get involved in ministry? Almost all of them, it started when they were in the upper elementary grades, academy, uh, high school age, or college. Somebody entrusted them with responsibility. So involvement is a huge key, I think, to, um, to, to, to engaging kids and keeping them in church. But here's the counterpart of that, okay? Are you ready? When youth and young adults are placed and mentored in their roles, they are more likely to stay and help move the mission of the church forward. If you're engaging their minds... In helping you solve the church's problems, they're far less likely to be running from the church. They're going to be applying their minds to those kind of things. Um, If I were to ask some of you, where did your involvement in the church start? What age were you? What happened? Did somebody ask you to do it, or did you just kind of get thrown in there? I mean, some nominating committees do that. I've seen youth leaders at the nominating committee elect them because they're looking for fresh meat. You know, <laughs> sling them in the door, slam it, and at the end of the year they come staggering out going, I'll never do that again. <laughs> but how did you get in? You're obviously involved because you're representing a church here this morning. Um, what is it about that? So when we look at those particular things, we need to then define a path to involvement. How do we develop a path to involvement? Now, again... There are a lot of different paths that different churches can take to get different people involved, and so there is not a singular path. We've developed, and I've had, I had Rob write up what he thought was important. I had my Young Adult Life Committee write up what they thought was important, and rather than trying to combine them all, I just left different lists in there, and we'll, we'll show you those as we go throughout the day. So you can get ideas from different people. There's not a singular right way to do this. The key is to help pull them in and get them involved. Notice Scripture. This is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 to 7. It says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. Now, let's focus on that word different for just a minute. Because sometimes in the church we forget that God created us different. And we think that ministry all has to be done the same way. And here's where the problem comes, especially when we begin dealing with handing it off to to another generation. We assume that it has to be done our way. I believe we have to teach and mentor our way, but allow freedom for them to create, take that and build on it and create it for their way. Here's why. 
Have you noticed, those of you who are getting older, this new generation, Generation Z, are a lot different than you? Have you noticed that at all? Anybody? What are some of the differences you've noticed? Technology, Technology for one, okay. <laughs> Less conservative thinking. Somebody else? Socially awkward. Why is that? They're connected. They don't know how to communicate from person to person. Have you noticed? I had a group of teenagers not too long ago, and, and there's two of them that are sitting over here at a table, not in this room, but in another room. I had a table off to the right, and they're sitting there texting all the time. And finally I just said, who are you guys talking to? Well, I'm talking to her. <laughs> You're in the same room. Yeah, but we didn't want you to know what we were talking about. Oh, I get it. But they are socially awkward. Somebody else, what's the difference? More what? Inclusive. More inclusive. They draw fewer lines of demarcation. Yes. Shorter Very much so. Shorter attention span. Matter of fact, Gen Y, the millennials that we've talked about forever, they said the average attention span for a Gen Wire was 11 seconds before something had to change. Any guesses on Gen Z? It's dropped to eight. And they're saying it's continuing to drop. But currently, they, they put it at eight. How they determine that, they've got some kind of scientific research and where they shift. But uh, as they've got brain things on them, uh, they're saying eight seconds, the average. Some are shorter, some are longer. You know some that have a two-second one. Um, <laughs> average is eight, okay? So different kinds of spiritual gifts because we have a whole different generation to reach, which means that different methodologies have got to be developed to reach this generation. Guess who's going to develop those methodologies? They are. Which means that our role shifts now into a mentoring and development role, and we engage and involve them. Does that make sense? In order to win their generation, Christ hasn't called them to win our generation. Now, some of them may, nor has he called us to win their generation, but some of us may. We, he's called us to make disciples so that they can make disciples. And if we make good disciples, our disciples will make more disciples in their generation. Different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service. Notice that word different again. It's not all going to look the same. But we serve the same Lord. God works in, what's that word? Different ways. But it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Now, what I want us to understand is, you guys are different people. Some of you are really different, if you know what I mean. And that's what my wife says about me. She says I'm special. Uh, not retarded, just special. Um, different is not bad. We somehow in the church, now in, in society, we'll embrace different. We want different. You go to a grocery store. Back in the 1970s, there were about 400 uh, items on the shelf to choose from. Anybody want to guess what you currently have at a, a Super Walmart? Hmm? No. No. close to 12,000 options. You see what happens to choices? Not only do you have black beans, you've got so many different choices of black beans, and some that have spice in them, and some that don't have spice in them, and some that are generically labeled, and some that are, you know, to me, when you open a can, they all look black, but there are different options Choices, and you've got, and there's different prices, and there's different, for some reason, we place different values on them. We have so many different choices, and so we look at that and we say, this is good, to some degree. 
But somehow in the church we've come to say, now what you do is you, you hold a series of meetings if you're going to do evangelism. Well, we can go a little bit different. You can have a Revelation seminar too. <laughs> because that might bring in a few. Uh, and again, I'm not saying those are bad. What I am saying is there are also different ways to do evangelism. And we've got to begin becoming more creative, especially with this generation who has so many options. They've got so many, just in their cell phone selection, they've got so many options. And even with one given type of cell phone, there are options. How many gig do you want? Um, do you want it with this processor or that processor? It just goes on. We have got to take the church and, and let the church begin to realize, especially those younger members of the church, that it's okay to do it differently. The message stays the same, but the methods have got to change. Does that make sense? Ellen even said, we must constantly be seeking new ways new methods to present the gospel of Jesus in a fresh light. We don't typically do that. We do our series because it's safe. And we say, well, this is time-tested. The problem is, uh, and I said on some evangelism committees, it's beginning to cost more and more and more to accomplish the same number of baptisms. So where we used to, we used to do it, uh, cost of meetings broken down by number of baptisms. So you'd say, well, it'd take you $700 to get one baptism, generally. $700 spent could equal one baptism. Then it went to about $1,000 a baptism. And then it went to, and this is traditional meetings I'm talking about, to about $2,500 a baptism. And I was sitting there as a youth pastor at one point, and I said, if you'll give me that $2,500, I'll get you more than one baptism because there's a lot of different ways to do it. So my point is not to, to, to bash evangelism. I think we need to develop new ways of evangelizing and allow kids to do so. Yes? What's, what's, what's the breakdown of, of, that, of that cost? Well, what they do is they take the whole series cost and they divide it by the number of people that got baptized okay. during the series. That's the, the simple breakdown. I, I just wonder whether the problem isn't... You know, talking about methodologies is, you know, I'm, I, I grew up in the Caribbean. Sure. And so, you know, you ran, uh, uh, in the 80s, you ran a tent meeting for maybe like eight weeks. Right. You can't do that today. But what I wonder is, in terms of approach, is that we, we have maybe in some ways frustrated the New Testament model, which they weren't running, running eight-week uh, campaigns. Five nights a week. Right. Because, because the notion was, was that was that the gospel was be contagious and organic. Yes. So if, if I'm a, a, a trader and I live in Athens, as I talk with people, I'm going to talk about, you know, the person that I know. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a follower of the way. I'm following Christ. Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Mm -hmm. So that's, there's no $2,500 cost to me talking exactly. to a friend with someone that I'm, that I'm meeting. That's so right. I think what we've done is, when we've, the corporate side of church evangelism yep. is where that cost factor Exactly, is. exactly. There have always been people willing to share organically. And those, those don't cost. I'm talking about the, the, the evangelism series right. that we've done. The, you know, so, yeah. I have a friend, uh, some of you may know him, Marco Torres. He's a pastor. I almost yelled polo, but... <laughs> he went to Australia and he posted on, on Facebook that he was, he's a veteran that when they went to Iraq he had to go through special training to learn about IUDs and, and the way the enemy works and he goes when he set foot in Iraq he said everything that you guys learned has changed mm -hmm. and he goes the same thing with our evangelism right. the enemy knows us so well yep. he's been doing it the same way for the past 50 years Something's got to change. That's right. That's right. And there's different ways. Here's, here's the kicker. Let's finish this out one here. A spiritual gift is given to how many of us? 
each of us so we can what? Help each other. You see, there's no age limit put on this. You'll, you'll look in Scripture, I've gone from cover to cover, never found an age limit put on a spiritual gift. The condition was, have you accepted Christ? He's gifted you. Now, when we, when we begin looking at uh, this whole process, and when a church says, whether overtly or inadvertently, there's no room for you to practice your spiritual gift here, because you don't do it like we do it. In essence, what we're saying is, the door is closed to you here. And no one stays where they don't feel needed or wanted. You won't at a party. If you don't feel like you're really wanted there, you feel like it's awkward, what do you do? Yeah, let's slide out at the first earliest convenience. Um... So when all the jobs are filled, so to speak, just because nominating committee finished their work and they put a name beside all the titles so they can send it to the conference office, we have actually ceased being a living, breathing work of God as a community, and we've actually limited ourselves to becoming a play church. That is, we've given everybody roles to play, and they all act them out on Sabbath morning. And the problem is the church grows stale and the young people within our midst say, if this is what church is about, I'm out. I don't feel needed, wanted, don't feel like that's what I want to do. So what could a path to involvement look like? We're going to flash that especially this afternoon in the third session. Um, but it would be a path that would take them from the introduction when they, when they come through the door to the church all the way through to them becoming a disciple-making disciple. That's kind of the path we're looking at. In the case of those that grew up in the church, it would mean starting with each of them and helping them identify and develop their spiritual gifts and then helping place them in a ministry that fits them. Now, you'll notice a few different suggestions in your packets, the role of liaison. Um, let me just point out a few. One says, it's a, it's a yellow sheet or bright green or whatever you call that color that knocks your eyes out. YA liaison role description. That Pastor Rob put together. Um, there's another one that I had the um, I had my young adult leadership council put together. It's called the YA Liaison Potential Clear Discernible Path. Just kind of look those over very quickly. We're going to come back to, to these in just a minute. But notice, nothing is absolute. It's saying, look, this is what we kind of see as the baselines. This is kind of how we see this role playing out. This is kind of what we see as a clear, discernible path. And, and again, what it really comes down to is, how do you become a connector? And this liaison position that we're proposing is not a teaching position, it's a connecting position. It's a person that's, that's out there, that they're in the foyer, they're, they're watching, especially for young adults. Uh, they love Jesus, they love people, and they want, especially young people, they want to bring the two together. And, and, and a person who truly wants to be in this role, as, as Pastor Rob has written, so he says they're always scanning for senior youth, young adults, to welcome them if they're visiting. Seek to call them by name if they're members or fringe attenders. Touch base with any you see on Sabbath. Follow up contact with those who've just visited. Assess where they are in their spiritual journey, whether a non-believer, a young believer, disciple in the making it advanced or baptized or not. Invite them to be involved in entry-level position to give them a chance to be involved and to give the church a chance to get to know their strengths and weaknesses. And then he goes on to try to keep it simple. Um, but the idea is, how do I become a connector? And then, um, I've kind of added my own to it. Because I'm in charge of this, so I get to do that. I, I say, first of all, identify who the top three influencers are in your church. Why would that be important? 
You influence the influencers, they influence the rest of the church. It makes your work a lot easier. It's something that nobody ever thinks about. But it's very, very simple, and it makes sense when you stop to think about it. If I can influence the influencers, get them on board, they will then influence the rest of the church. And I say top three because you may strike out with two of the three. But if you get one, if you get all three, this is, this is the shoe in. You can make it happen. But identify the top three influences in your church. And then seek to influence them in this particular way. Um, you, you win the influencers, you win the church. And then you want to outline to or with them what a path to involvement might look like in your church. And again, it's going to be different because every church is different. But what does that path look like? Um, and that's where this potential clear discernible path thing could come in. Um, in order to make a cultural change, the church has to have some buy-in. So intentional relational, relationship building starts before the walk-in. And then the walk-in, and here again, you can read all this on your own, but warm greeting, point of contact, and Nate is going to go over some of this this afternoon, and Brian and, and uh, Allie are going to go over this. But point of contact, assist in their needs, answer their questions, gather basic contact information. Offer a welcome folder with key ministries, who to contact, perhaps. Send them a Friday newsletter, Wednesday devotional, whatever. Get them involved, but have someone who actually follows up. And so you can go on through that. Uh, basically, you'll have time in a little bit to do that when we give you some assignments. Third thing, get acquainted with your church's vision for ministry. Does your church have an actual vision or mission statement that is memorable? Now, some of them have got long ones that try to include every last person on the planet. But my, my thinking is that what we want to do is we want to make sure... Morning! Good to see you guys. Um, we want to make sure that as we look at that particular aspect, that we're, we're taking something that is very local... Very, see, I, I go to churches. One of the things I've been doing is, is coaching churches in the process of culture change. And I'll ask them about their vision, mission statement, and I get stuff like this. To preach the everlasting gospel of the three angels to the world. Okay, but what are you going to do here in your, your city? Uh, how, how are you starting the world thing? Is that working out for you? The problem is, when you don't define it in a local setting, and what God is wanting you to do with your church in your setting, it makes it undoable, and it makes it very, very frustrating. Now, the GCA church members know what the vision statement is. They should. We have three at the table back there. And if I were to ask you guys, what is the mission of the GCA church? Church family exists to what? Now, some of you guys who went to GCA know that as well. Because we worked on that for like six years, pounding it in. That is the identified niche the academy church has. Did you know that most academy churches in North America don't have that as their goal? It would seem like it's a no-brainer. The kids are on your campus, you influence them for four years, you send them out. They impact the world. Too many of our churches have either become all faculty and students... Or they become huge community churches that don't even pay attention to the students. Um, one church I was at as a chaplain, when the greeters would be at the door, they're handing out bulletins. When the kids came over from the academy, they would just simply pull them in, watch them go by. Oh, you want one? Okay. Then it's, hi, happy Sabbath. And, and that was the extent of how they dealt with young people there. Um, so there's a niche that your church should occupy that God is calling you to. The problem is most churches haven't ever discovered what their mission and vision really is. They try to put it in broad, generic terms, so big that we don't leave anybody out. This isn't about leaving anybody out. This is helping you focus your resources. If you can focus your resources, you get more, more uh, mileage out of the money you actually spent you actually can begin to move down the road and begin to accomplish way more than you could by trying to win the world with the three angels' messages. 
That's important. Ryan. I think one of the biggest things that can help the church be more effective in retaining young people is when people who come into church are young people who are not in the church. Right. Because see, if the church is about your everyday life, then people will get excited to come there on Sabbath instead of leaving the church at the church on Sabbath and not having it during the week. It should be Christianity is more than theology; it's a lifestyle. Exactly. It's taking your theology, turning it into your biography. You can write that. That's good stuff, right there. Um, <laughs> put that out there for free. So. As you connect people, develop ways to work towards supporting the vision of the church. You have to know the vision of the church first to help them work towards supporting. Too many times we have so many ministries that don't support the church. They just support that person's idea. And so if you can gather your ministries around the niche mission of your church, where your church says this is how we're going to impact our community, you can begin to, to aim all the mission stuff that you have already going. You can actually help develop ways to work towards supporting the vision of the church. And guess what? You begin to gain more momentum. People want to be where momentum is happening. When your church has momentum, people come and say, I, I like what you're doing. I want to be part of this. But they walk into a church where nothing is happening except a stale Sabbath school discussion on Sabbath morning which most of our Sabbath schools, I'm, I'm sorry, but I travel around of all, all of our churches, and, and I go into Sabbath schools all over the conference. Most of them, in my opinion, have turned into just an opinion fest. Well, I think, well, I think, and it's not, how does, this, how does God's word impact and intersect with my life? What changes do I need to be making? What does that mean? How, how does that imply I should be treating you? We've gotten to, well, I think that, and we do this whole head game, and it never touches our heart. And so, as we connect with people, develop ways to work towards supporting the vision of the church. And here's an important one. Connect one person at a time. You can have these great, grandiose visions, but connecting only happens one person at a time. And if you can do it one person at a time, you do this person and this person, and this person, and you work with them, and you help them work with somebody else, and they do one, 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 and, and they do one, one. Pretty soon, you've expanded. And that's the, the, the process that Jesus gave us. I just want to make a point that's maybe germane to your you know, connecting one person at a time. I think, from, again, from, from, from the New Testament, the, 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 the definition of what church was is, I think, very different than what it is today. Yes. When we say church, we think of it in a very impersonal way. The church is the church board, you know. It's the building. The, it's the building, you know. It's, it's, it's the, the, the organized. So when we say church, we don't say, well, I'm. The church. I'm the church. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that when, you, when you were talking about the generations, I think that that is what has come down. When they, young people think maybe church, it's, oh, it's them, not me. It's them. That's right. So if we don't, if we don't make the connection, uh, both intellectually mm -hmm. and relationally, then it's going to be very difficult to to have the transformation that we're looking for. Absolutely, well said, well said. That's that's exactly the point. Uh, and and right now, if you were to talk to a group of young people and young adults, you'll find it very much us versus them. And, and I hear from, from, from youth groups all the time, well, they won't let us, they won't. And I said, well, who's the church? And it's always in their minds, they. Yeah. yeah so kind of what you started off talking about, I took some notes out here, you were talking about current research and how we're losing two-thirds. And I was just writing things down off that, and this is just kind of what's going into what you were just mentioning. Um, you said evangelism does not make up for who we lose out the back door. Mm -hmm. I circled evangelism and I put startup. And I circled backdoor as inside or in reach. Mm. If you want to look at millennials, most millennials do not have trust in corporations, big government, people of positional leadership. Because, I mean, 
it's always been slighted and pointed out that they are automatically corrupt. It's all about money, it's about themselves, mm -hmm. it's selfish. And it pins against this natural us versus them mentality, like you just mentioned. Yes. So church has become that type of organization. Mm -hmm. So therefore, just like what millennials would look at as um, big pharma or big government or all these things that automatically, oh, you hold a position in a title, therefore I can't trust you because you just you have an agenda. Mm -hmm. It's automatically transferred and associated into what we consider the church. Exactly. The church looks at, oh, well, there's a general conference and then there's a conference and, oh, you're just, you just have a title and it's the relationship that that's right. broken. So maybe you and I have a really great relationship and therefore I don't see you as a threat. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't know who you were, and I'm introduced to you as your title, as mm -hmm. your position, as part of this greater, I'm automatically going to put a buffer between you and me because I don't trust you, you have an agenda. That's right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And Gen Z is worse about that than even the millennials. Uh, Gen Z, especially if you come in leading with the title, um, all bets are off. Did you know that the, the oldest Gen Zs are now sophomores in college? We're, we're almost done with the millennials. Matter of fact, your youth group is totally done with millennials. Uh, it's all Gen Z. And so there's a whole lot more research that's being done there. But anyway, connect one person at a time. Um, we're going to go into a discussion time around your tables now. And um, you guys have got tons to discuss at this point. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to look at some questions. Yeah. Uh, I've got a, a, a kind of a phenomenon that's kind of bouncing around my head. Okay. It happened um, over, the, over the summer. It's been fun to you. And um, you know, we were talking about how the church could be more proactive online and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were saying, well, who do you have online? And I would go to different Christian gospel homes. I'd say, see, this person has 100,000 kids. They were taking me to websites whereby their artists had billions of hits. And so I'm saying there's some kind of great disconnect because of the, we're talking about getting 100,000 hits, and they're in the arena whereby they're talking about millions and billions of hits. And that's a disconnect that we are not up to with them. So we got to somehow. Get and guess what? We never will be. Uh, because, I, and, and Personally, I don't believe we're called to be. This is a belief, especially by Gen Zers, that the more hits you have, the more validated you are. In other words, if I've got a million hits, I must be really, really good. If I got a billion hits, I'm a phenom. You know, I, I got it made. Doesn't matter whether, and this is the funny thing too, Gen Zers will fact check you as you preach. The problem is they never really fact check the websites they're using to fact check you. They're just assuming because I can read it right here. Well, you said, that's all what this says. Well, no, what I mean is I was talking and I said that I need to figure out how to, how to do some training. I couldn't get everybody together at the same time. And then uh, they just came up to me and said, well, listen, we can help you with that. Sure. They said, well, how can you do it? And they came up with all of these creative ways to say, hey, listen, we can put you on this website. And it's not about the billion hits per se. Right. It's more about people having access to you. Exactly. So yeah, and I got you there. Okay. Yeah, and, and quite frankly, I think that this is one of the best ways you can use, especially Gen Z, <laughs> is helping you have an online presence. And, and their involvement is really, in that ministry, is really key to, to actually maintaining a relationship with them. It still happens one relationship at a time. Um, and so I think that, yeah, for online access, we, we need to have a, a good online presence. It needs to be not stale. Uh, I go to too many wet church websites, and, and nobody's changed anything for two years. And you go to their calendar to see it, <laughs> and the calendar, the last thing they have is 2014. <laughs> oh, they all died in 2014, and nobody's done anything since then. Um, and somebody may have posted one picture from last week's church picnic on their Facebook site, and you're going, Yeehaw, there we go. There is a person alive in that church. Um, so yes, utilize them to do those kind of things. What I'm talking about is on the front side of that, 
we've got to connect one person at a time with them and help plug them into those kind of roles that will help the mission of the church. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Okay. Morning, Roderick. Join the table. Morning. Guys driving from long distances, we're glad you're here. So, let's go to his discussion questions now. And here's what I want you to discuss around the tables. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that not everybody around your table knows people in your church, and that's okay. They don't have to. But who do you think are the top three in, in your church? And then ask yourself why. How would you find a top three influencer, one of the top three influencers? Well, here's how I do as a pastor when I move into a church. I watch. I watch who people listen to. I watch on church board when somebody says something and it ends all discussion, especially if it's been a volatile discussion. And somebody says, well, you know, I think what we should do is, and everybody goes, oh, that's good, I'll do that. That's one of your top three influences right there. Um, a person that, when, every, when, when that person speaks, uh, everyone in the church listens. Now, an influencer can be a positive influencer. They can also be a negative influencer. And so if you've got a top negative influencer, that's going to be something you've got to work with. But see if you can define, think of at least uh, three influencers in your church. And then talk about how can you get influencers on board helping you connect newcomers and currently uninvolved members. What are some things you could do? And if you could sketch your church's path to involvement, what would it include? What are some things, and you can look at these sheets and stuff, and you're going to have about 15 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back together and kind of briefly debrief of these things, but uh, they're, they're going to be on the screen. So... Take some time right now around your tables and just talk with each other. And then at the end of that, we'll, uh, we'll get back together. Let, let me clarify one thing I didn't say. The top three influencers would not, you would not include the pastor. That's assuming the pastor is an influencer or not. So I heard pastors. Yeah. I heard that at two or three different tables right there. I, I forgot to mention that. If, if your pastor is not an influencer, you're in trouble. <laughs>